All right, welcome to the first of two videos for Chapter 8 from Math 120. Sorry about no um, no webcam this time. I know that's disappointing, but somehow you'll survive. Um, <laughs> uh, just had to kind of make do with what I have. I wasn't able to uh, find time on campus, so I'm doing this at home, and you don't want to see a picture of my house in the background. All right, so um, here is the two main ideas we're going to talk about. Um, and I've got a couple of examples here just to illustrate the idea. So in chapter 8 we're going to be looking at how when we do a sample how are those statistics that we calculate distributed because different samples will have different distributions. So for example I've got one here this was from the Trib, the Chicago Tribune talking about average monthly rents and they calculated this average monthly rent to be uh, about $1100. Now that's a got to be from a sample of apartment rents. They didn't look at every single apartment in Chicago to get that. So the question is, how accurate is it? Is is it plus or minus $100, plus or minus $10? And how accurate is that? What is the typical average monthly rent going to be if we know what all the rents are? Because this is clearly just going to be from a sample. Uh, along the same lines, uh, here I have some results from a Pew Research poll. And it's about same-sex marriage. This um, this is one they've been doing for a long time. Um, and so they have data from year to year, and they have recently, that in their most recent survey, 55% of Americans support same-sex marriage. Now, they didn't ask every single American. They did a poll. They polled uh, probably a few thousand people. So the question is, if they did a different random sample, assuming the same proportion of Americans actually support it, then you know it hasn't been you know 20 years since. So assuming it's the same moment in time and it's also a random sample, would the next one be as much as 58% or as low as 40% or what? How accurate is this proportion? And so that's the type of thing we're going to look at. We're going to start with the distribution of the sample mean, and so we're going to talk about how to describe what is the distribution of the sample mean, and then to compute some probabilities. So to look at the distribution of the sample mean, I'm going to refer back to, back to an example we did before where I talked about um, an assessment that was uh, worth 15 points that was given to 145 general ed stats students. That's a Math 102 is um, general education stats. and uh, here are the results. This is a histogram, just a single-valued histogram, and you can see kind of a left-skewed distribution. If we overlay that with the distribution of sample means of size 10, so these aren't, these are, ah, are these all the sample means of size 10? Because there'd be a lot of them. I don't think it is. So I think if we look at, I think this was like 100 samples of size 10. Um, notice that the 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 sample means aren't as spread out because these values, the 0, 1, and 2, are mitigated by some of these higher values. So the sample means uh, are more evenly distributed or more um, condensed here. And you'll also notice that the average of those sample means is the same as the population mean, which makes sense. If you have 100 different samples, you would expect the mean of all of those means which sounds weird to say, but you'd expect the mean of all of those means to be what the population mean is. Uh, and if we go one step further and look at a samples of size 30, they're even more condensed. Um, the standard deviation is even smaller now. The mean of, of those, though, is still 10.6. So some sample means had a mean of, you know, 9.7 or something like that. But if you average all those sample means together, the mean is still 10.6. So this brings us to one of the key results from pretty much all of statistics, and it is called the Central Limit Theorem. And it says no matter how um, the original variable is distributed, as the size of our sample increases, it roughly cut off with about 30. As long as we have at least 30 in our sample, the sample mean distribution will be approximately normal with this mean and standard deviation. Now this to me is crazy, but let, let me show you what this means. So there's a little applet here. Actually, whoops, I already have it open. Forgot about that. I already have it open. So here are, we, we're pretending, uh, we're going to do this down here. So these are some sample mean. I don't know where the original variable is, but these are some sample means. And as I increase the sample size, 
you'll notice that the distributions get more and more and more condensed. Um, this is there's a little generator here, and I can change the sample. But if I change the sample, it doesn't really change the center or the spread that much. It's just giving me a different random sample, uh, different. I don't know how many this is. Is it 100? Uh, 200. Oh no, 200. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's 200 pseudo random numbers. Pseudo random numbers are technically when you use a computer to generate random numbers. It's not really random. It's using something to calculate those. So the point here, though, is as the sample size increases, the distribution becomes more condensed uh, because the means are less spread out. So let's see if we can go back to that PowerPoint. All right. So this is a huge result. You're going to want to write these formulas down. You're not going to be provided these. If we're looking at the distribution of a sample mean, the mean of the sample means is the same as the mean of the population. But the standard deviation of the sample means is smaller. In fact, it is the population standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. So the larger the sample size, the smaller this standard deviation of the sample mean becomes. So let's do it with some examples. I've got a couple here. We're going to kind of work through here. I just I took screenshots of um, StatCrunch. We may pop over there later, uh, but I just kind of wanted to speed it up a little bit. So we know that um, we've been looking at these heights of three-year-old boys. We know they're approximately normally distributed with a mean of 37.4, standard deviation of 1.4 inches. So we could ask the question from chapter 7, what is the probability that a randomly selected three-year-old boy will be at least 38 inches tall? So we know the mean is 37.4 inches, that'll be right in the middle. 38 then will be less than one standard deviation, so not too far to the right. And we're going to find that area to the right of that. So I have a stat crunch uh, screenshot here. Um, we can't really see that pretty small there, but it's, so it's about, looks like about 33% chance of that happening. 33% chance of having a boy um, be 38 inches or taller, because that's eh, that's not that much higher than uh, the mean. But now let's rephrase it. What if I say, what is the probability that a random sample of 33-year-old boys has a mean height of at least 30 inch, 38 inches? Now, you could say, going back here, there's a lot of boys that have 38 inches or more but boy, to have an average of that with all of these other values in here, to still have an average that high, that would be pretty, that's not the same. So the thing is that now we're looking at the distribution of the sample mean. So the average sample mean should be the same as the population mean, but the standard deviation of those sample means isn't 1.4 now, because the sample means are much more condensed. The standard deviation of the sample mean is that 1.4 over the square root of n, which is pretty small, actually 0.256. So 38 is about two or, I don't know, two and a half something standard deviations. So it's actually much further to the right when we're looking at the distribution of the sample means now, not the distribution of x, the heights, but the distribution of the means when the sample is size 30. And so that probability ends up being much, much smaller. What is that, less than 1%? You know, about 1% of the time you'll have a, a random sample of 33-year-old boys that has a mean height that high. So when we look at the probability that one boy will be at, the, at least 38 inches tall, that was a mean of 37.4 and a standard deviation of 1.4 much smaller probability is that we have a random sample of 33 year old boys and that has a mean and so that has a mean of 37.4 but a standard deviation of sigma over the square root of n and so that probability was much much smaller now here's a conundrum that you're going to have on the test both of these problems are going to be on the test i'm going to be asking questions about what proportion of individuals, or what's the probability that an individual meets a certain criteria. And I will also be asking questions about what is the probability that a sample meets a certain criteria with its mean. And so you have to be clear, am I going to be looking at the standard deviation, just plug it in, or do I have a sample size, and so that standard deviation is much smaller, so I need to take sigma over the square root of n. That's going to be a really crucial point for you to distinguish and be able to identify. All right, let's do another example. Uh, so let's suppose that um, 
a test has a typically has a mean score of 74 with a standard deviation of 11. And let's suppose that a professor suspects that the current group of students is very strong. So he gives them the same exam he's done in the past. Um, the sample mean of those 30 students is 78. So a lot higher, right? I mean, the mean score is supposed to be 74. Um, and so now this mean score is 78. The question is, is this current class unusual? I mean, could 78 just happen randomly? Is that not that big of a deal? Or is getting a mean of 78 or higher pretty rare if it's supposed to be a mean of 74? So let's pick out some key values there. We have that mean score of 74. That's going to be the mean of our uh, sample means as well. Uh, we have a sample size of 30 again. And we have the standard deviation as 11, but that's the standard deviation of the individuals our sample means will be much more condensed. You'll notice that I, it could have been easy for me to round to 2, but because we're using this in a normal calculator, this isn't a final answer. I want to leave a lot of digits here. I usually do 4 or 5 or even 6. Put a lot of digits on this sigma because it's not your final answer. Generally, you do not want to round in your final answer. So the question now is, is it unusual? So to be unusual, we're going to say, well, what's the probability that the sample mean is at least 78? And so if we do that, there is the probability with that standard deviation of not 11, but 11 over the square root of 30. And so that probability then is pretty small, 0 0.0232. So based on our cutoff of unusual, yeah, it would be unusual to have that class average of 78. So since this that would be unusual for that to happen randomly it would be safe for this professor to say yep this is a pretty good group this average is the the chances of this getting this average or higher just randomly is about two percent of the time two percent of the time you'll get a class average of this higher higher now it could have just by happenstance students got lucky or something and it just randomly happened to be that high but Chances are, this is actually a better group than average. All right, that is it from the distribution of the sample mean. Uh, and so we'll check the next video for the distribution of the sample proportion.